Uh, he's a professor and uh, subspecialist in trauma surgery and trauma critical care, uh, director and academic head at the Milk Park Hospital Academic Trauma Center, and Professor Emeritus in Surgery at the University of Witwatersrand. He has recently been awarded membership of the Academy of Masters, uh, Surgical Educators of the American College of Surgeons. Okay. He's uh, Secretary General and Past President of the International Society of Surgery or the ISS in Switzerland and past president of the International Association for Trauma Surgery and Intensive Care, which is called the IATSE. On the lighter side, he is a colonel at the Military Health Training of the South African Military, Military Health Service. He doesn't only dwell on land, but he also dwells in the air and in the sea because our next speaker is a licensed uh, fixed wing and helicopter pilot and scuba diving. So without further ado, I would like to give you our next uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Ken Buffard, who will talk on DSTC virtual platform, face-to-face -face or blended learning. Take it away, Prof. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Andrew, thank you for your kind words, also for the fact that pronouncing the name of my university is always a challenge. And um, what a strand. No, yes. you, you got it. You got it right. Uh, lit literally, in an our badge, that is white water is gold, and what you can see on on our university badge is the gold bearing rock, and the rock is blue. In our, in our area. So thank you so much to you, the entire organizing committee, um, for the privilege of being here. Um, very soft spot in, in, in my heart for what you are doing and for my colleagues, especially in Malaysia and Sri Lanka. But, and uh, Gilberto uh, forgot to mention that he is also at one point head of the DSTC program in Hong Kong. So it's, it's a great privilege to be back here. I was asked to talk about DSTC and, and some of these bits may be familiar to you, but I wanted to talk about where we're going with it and equally importantly, how we're adapting, not just to the COVID issue, but also to the new form of learning. Let's start off by saying, we don't do intensive care. Nowadays, very few surgeons, very few emergency specialists do intensive care. So why must we waste our time on intensive care? And the answer is, comes back to a gentleman called Donald Trunkey, 1988. And in many ways, he is the father of trauma. And this is one of the few slides that I have the privilege of reading. But he states that it is contention that failure to care for the surgical patient, note, not the surgery, the patient, and a doctor who has not been exposed to intensive care is incompletely trained, unqualified, and totally unprepared for surgical practice or specialty training. Never let it be said that he was subtle. But the reality is if we don't understand how our patient works, we really are not in a position where we can treat our patient. So I would like to dedicate the DSTC, and Don Trunkey was one of the founders, and this talk both to the father of trauma surgery, Don Trunkey, and also to all of you involved in the care of the trauma patient. It doesn't matter where you serve, civil, military, humanitarian, you put yourselves in harm's way, and I salute you. The problem is very simple. Violence in society is increasing. Road traffic crashes are now the fourth most common cause of death in the world, and it's rising. We're getting on top of most disease processes, including the latest one, but I'm not sure we've got on top of people's driving. The second thing is that on many situations, the expertise and the victim are mismatched. So how does one design a course which is primarily designed for peaceful countries and that can be applied anywhere. And every country has a different form of education. That's the reality. If you go and learn something in Germany, 
it is wholly different to the way it's taught in India um, or Japan. In the West anyway, I don't want to look at this, but in the West anyway, there are decreased working hours. In Europe and the United Kingdom, training in surgery is now 37 hours a week for five years. In America, outcry, it has dropped from 100 hours a week down to 80 hours for five years. You have a choice. You have lifestyle or you have surgery. Do you want my job or don't you? Well, I hate to say this, but 60% of patients, 60% uh, of medical students are female. But 5% of surgeons worldwide are female. And this mismatch is going to um, come up and bite us. So we do have to bear that in mind all the time. Education and training, what do we mean by them? Well, Trunky defined education as the process of changing the knowledge base and the mindset. I apologize for the typo. Training is the process of changing the skill set and the dexterous ability of the person applying it. So they're actually two different things. Education is the why and the training is the how to. And at the end of that, with a bit of luck, you end up with competence. And this definition comes from Professor the Lord Darcy of Denham, who is the makes pronouncing University of Advanced easy. Uh, competence is the acquisition and the mastery of knowledge and the skills and abilities necessary at a level of expertise. You can take a very untrained medical student and teach them to do an appendicectomy until something goes wrong or until they miss the complication. And all of that had to be done to achieve competence. So DSTC was a conversation that was held between six international surgeons. It assumes advanced trauma knowledge. ATLS is the gold standard, but there are others as well. It's targeted not just at surgeons, but surgeons and anesthesiologists and unsaid here, operative room nurses. Anyone with the responsibility for the decision-making, but the limited exposure to trauma. I've long since learned, and many of you with whom I've worked on DSTC courses, when my scrub nurse turns around and says, Prof, have you considered using this particular instrument? What she's actually saying is, you know, you're an idiot. If you'd used this a little while ago, you would be doing much better than you are at the moment. So, ATLS, credit to the American College of Surgeons, six surgeons from across the world, Howard Champion from the US, Stephen Dean from Australia, Abe Fingerhood from France, Stan Lenquist from Sweden, uh, David Mulder from Canada, and Trunky had a conversation pretty much like this, but didn't want to put it under the American College of Surgeons because they felt that this was too global. And in fact, if anybody knew how to deal with trauma, it was more likely to be the Americans and maybe South Africans. So they wanted the rest of the world. And those of you who have done the DSTC course will recognize this slide. And they put it under the auspices of an international, the largest international association of all. Uh, it's also the oldest international association, International Society of Surgery. And its trauma branch is known as YATSIC. And many of you are members of YATSIC. One of the things that's changed recently is the whole fee structure has dropped so that anyone from a resource challenged country pays between 25 and 50 percent of the normal membership fee for full privileges. And if you're under 40 or a trainee, it drops to half that. And if you drop and become a member when you're a medical student, you come in at something like five dollars a year for an awful lot of privileges. Currently, DSTC is owned in 33 countries across the world and is, in fact, the world's largest and most advanced uh, surgical course outside of, DS, uh, outside of ATLS. The league at the moment, 571 courses presented worldwide. Spain, amongst other countries, are now requiring it by law for the training of all surgeons and all anesthesiologists. Some countries, 
maybe for health reasons or because of uh, cost reasons, are not active at the moment. And over 10,000 people have been trained worldwide. We can't quite match Karen Goh's PHTLS, but we are on the uh, fifth edition of the DSTC manual. We were fortunate enough to win the prize from the British Medical Association for the best medical textbook in the world. Uh, and that's because this book was written by DSTC faculty worldwide. I had the privilege of editing it, but what was in it, and I would actually write, like to recognize Gilberto because the neurosurgery section is to a large uh, part credit for him. As you know, there are lectures, but we try and hold the lectures to a maximum of 15 minutes. They're there to set the scene, and I'll come back to that. The next thing is there is a large amount of hands-on tissue skills, either in a live animal laboratory, and I'll come back to that, or where possible in a cadaver laboratory. And you've seen a presentation a little earlier on the ACID course. About half the courses in the world have now integrated ACID with ACID and the American College's permission. And it's now an integral part of the DSTC curriculum in most countries in Europe and several other places as well, including South Africa. There are group discussions. You've all seen those too, patient and case discussions on surgical decision-making. But perhaps the biggest difference between the DSTC and uh, ATLS is the flexibility of being able to manage the course for the country in which it's taking place. So a country can take ownership of DSTC, provide a course which isn't a gee whiz, I wish we had access to a CT scanner for every single person at the gate. It's a course that can be designed and modified for countries no matter where they are. We've introduced two specific add-on modules. Trauma critical care, because we owe it to Don Trunkey, is now an integral module and anesthesiologists and trauma surgeons, whoever else, do the critical care module together. And the number of courses I've been on where the cross fertilization from surgeons saying, gee, that's such an easy way of putting in a central line or doing whatever. And anesthesiologists say, you know, I never realized that there was something going on in the other side of the green towel known as the blood brain barrier. We also have long since learned that military has long crossed over into civil and vice versa. I'll come back to that. And then there's a whole bunch of practical skills, including now surgery in a humanitarian and austere environment. So I've come back to the initial question. I'm not sure whether that's the patient or the trauma surgeon, but we never see penetrating trauma. Why do we need to do it? And the answer is, since I don't know how to do it, what I'll do is a CT scan and that'll make things much better, except it doesn't. Because unfortunately, the CT scanner is known as the donut of death for good reason. So a brief SWOT analysis on DSTC, very simply, the world's most advanced open surgical course with a very, very high instructor participant ratio. It has strong core team training. We now launch all DSTC courses with a lecture on non-technical skills. And one of the things that I illustrate that with is some of you may remember a pilot who landed his aircraft in the Hudson River in 2013 and everybody else got off that plane. Um, when asked by the press, how did you do it? He said, it was a team. And they said, well, were you worried about the cabin crew? And he said, no, they were trained to do their job and I was trained to do mine. And I think that's the reality is that DSTC is not a pilot. It is not a single person. If you don't have the engineer, the refueler, the ticket agent, the boarding agent, cabin crew, maintenance crew, flight crew, air traffic control, that plane will not fly. So unless we can teach each other to talk to each other, the plane will not fly. So there's a common core curriculum and then, as I said, depending on what you need, you can match what's required. 
The cost of live tissue can be expensive. The cost of a course runs from about $350 in countries like South Africa to $2,500 across Europe. So sometimes it's unaffordable. But is there an opportunity? Absolutely. Countries that were previously peaceful are not now peaceful. Anesthesiologists can't make a patient better without surgeons. Surgeons cannot make a patient better without anesthesiology. Neither can do it unless you have a, a scrub system that works. Europe will tell you there have been more military injuries in the civilian environment, bomb blasts and people firing automatic rifles inside civil environments. So doctors who were brought up on the little old lady with a fractured uh, neck of femur and now having to deal with major gunshots when they've never seen a gunshot. To put it into perspective, I was pleased to see that on the Tung Tok Sen course in two months time on the 24th of April, Tina Garda from um, Ullaval in, in Oslo. Now Oslo is a population of about a million. She's the trauma surgeon there. They have about five homicides from gunshots per annum, five per year. And I suspect Singapore and parts of Japan and many parts of Asia are very similar. So how many gunshots have you ever seen? None, this is my first one. Parallel development with, with the asset course and where we're going in the last five minutes of this talk is going to be spent uh, on e-learning. The threats to this course, the animal rights, in particularly some countries, are very powerful. But we can't do without live tissue training. Simulation, blood does not clot. You can tell people it clots. Pulse rates don't go up responding to the surgeon's movements. They go up because the simulating person on the computer says, oh, the surgeon's done such and such, I'm going to push the pulse rate. The cost is a problem. And how can we bring this course to a resource poor country? Well, one of the things has been a huge amount of multinational collaboration. And one of the biggest benefits has been tying in with countries' military. So we've tied in firstly with two non-military organizations, Imperial College in London and the University of Gothenburg. And more recently, we've partnered for our educational programs with the Royal College of Surgeons of England. The Vigorous Warrior Military Program is a NATO program. It involved 16,000 doctors, nurses, and medical troops a couple of years ago. And this is teaching, and none of those countries have very full-time professionals in their military in the sense of surgeons. They're at peace. They don't have that. So how do you teach surgeons in uniform who is the breast surgeon at the local hospital? And so you've got to change your thinking quite a bit. Now, where does e-learning come in? Well, most of us at this Congress may think that e-learning is actually computer gaming, and computer gaming is something that your teenage son or teenage daughter, or you learned as a medical student, but how many of you can put your hands up and say, I'm a consultant surgeon, my computer is for PowerPoint, not for gaming. And therefore, if you show me a patient I'm not interested, I'm gonna get very bored. So how do we do this? And you've got to utilize a blended learning approach. Now this is a case description in PowerPoint. Many of you will have seen this particular sort of case and many of you will work through it. It works well to a point, the only trouble is, one is it's impossible to do with our faculty there. And two, one has the situation of in many courses, the participants are very reluctant to stick their neck out. Uh, Japan has some of the highest level of care in the world, but a Japanese audience is probably not very good at volunteering information. So the way it starts, and you're very familiar with this, handgun, those are the wounds. The ABCs, patients fine. Note the times. Secondary survey, four wounds in the leg, pulses normal. And there are the pictures. And you can see lots of metal behind the knee and so on. Now, what are your decision points? Do you measure the ABI or whatever? And everything stops. And you then have an interactive discussion with the faculty and the participants. That is the way we do it. 
Why? Because we then say, okay, we've agreed a patient's going to need theater. What do we do next? How do we, do we wait? Do we, and so on. Blended learning says e-learning can be knowledge acquisition, remember education and training, and that is done as one does in HDLS, manual and a multiple choice question paper before they come. Data can be given in e-lectures, again, pre-recorded lectures, participants can study at home. But what about patients? The strength is the skills being taught and when to apply. Yes, there are face-to-face -face lectures and there are practical skills. So let's take the same case, and this was uh, done together with the University of Gothenburg. Same case, you're all familiar with this. And each, uh, at the bottom of each, uh, there's a little box which says next. And there are the same numbers as before. Next. There are the same injuries as before. Next. So what are the key decision points? Do you want to feel for pulses? Do you want to x-ray both limbs? Or do you want to do a CT angiogram? Oh, I, I come from a sophisticated center. We'll do a CT angiogram. Uh-oh, the foot pulses are re reduced. CT angio is not yet indicated. Should we please go back? Do you want to do an x-ray with metal markers? Yeah, that's a good idea. Right, so now I know what I'm dealing with. Now, what do you want to do? Oh, I think I'm going to go exploration of vessels. Well, they're reduced, but you know, there's injuries above and below. So you actually screwed up. So now where are we going to go next? You better go back to those decisions. Um, okay, I'm going to measure compartment pressures. Good answer. Uh, now, what are you going to do? CT angio. Well, there is the angio you could do. And so it goes on. And now you're going to say operative explanation. Can you wait? There we go. Oh, no, I'm going to wait. You blew it, mate. And so what you can do is interact. But there's a problem with that. And this is where it was tossed to our colleagues at, uh, in the artificial intelligence setup at Imperial. Because if you think about it, if you've got five choices, you have a faculty present, you can make the right or the wrong choices can be discussed. If you have no faculty present, you have to choose one. And then whatever you choose will give you five choices. So now you've got five initial. Each one has five choices, which has five choices. And this is the picture showing what the system you've just seen because you can be led up the garden path the computer will actually look out the way you're thinking and offer you the choices that you think you want and you think you're doing well until the patient demises so it's not just a stark choice of five as you develop the case it will develop differently five tiers you're looking at over three thousand different patient care scenarios in a virtual patient so this is changing the whole thing, but it does mean you think, oh, I'm really doing well until you kill the patient. The computer will also work on the metrics. How long did you take to make each decision? And it will then analyze that and then work out what was your dilemma that made you take longer. And you will then get a tutorial back from the computer as to why the choice that you took a longer time over was right or wrong. So you can identify different challenges. There's a shared need, but you do need to have a concept of a new design of virtual patients. It doesn't get away from the interaction of patients where you're now relying on experience because with the virtual patient, you're relying on consensus, not the experience of your faculty. So an educational model has got to be flexible. And that's where we're working. We're dealing with competing organizations. In the greater scheme of things, ATLS is probably that 747, and DS with several million people trained, and DSTC has a very limited area, and it's a much smaller aircraft. Are they competing? 
Actually not. They both need a crew. They both need a runway. And they both need their teams. Are the teams all heading in the same direction? Well, clearly at this particular airfield in the Caribbean, probably not. So anesthesia and surgery are not competing. Anesthesia and surgery have got to decide the direction they both want to go before they both start taking off simultaneously. Can we learn from the military? You betcha. Can the military learn from civilian? You betcha. There are different priorities. But you know that the one thing that's in common is the patient. And are patients single or multiple? Well, multiple may mean a small minibus crash. South Africa, like many parts in Asia, is rife and populated with 16-seater minibuses. A lot of airbags in there, mainly human. Are the injuries single or multiple? We need to cover all of these because that is the reality of major trauma in 2021. Anesthesia is an integral part of DSTC. Nursing is an integral part of DSTC. And military injuries are an integral part of civilian and the other way round because civilian surgeons may be part-time in uniform and have never seen what they're going to be doing. So what are the challenges in trauma? This is the traditional trauma, critical care and anesthesiology. But the recognition in 2021, even without COVID, is very simple. It is not like this. It's like this. The overlap is far, far greater. And just look at the extra number of patients that can be treated well if everyone talks to each other. So e-learning will give commonality. E-learning will reduce on-course time by providing better pre-study time. And therefore, you can almost reduce DSTC by about a third simply by reducing the lecture time. You could have colleague to colleague interaction on Zoom to a point, but it's extremely difficult to read an audience when you're looking at a whole lot of black coffins with people's names on them. So it must be relevant it must be stimulating, but it also must take the other thing from DSTC, I remind you, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment, hopefully somebody else's. And I would suggest that you cannot put that experience into the same level unless you are actually in the same real room. So the direction of DSTC is going electronic. It is being discussed and is already in well advanced in the preparation of pre post tests e-learning. The virtual platform is fine for the preparation for the course, but I don't think we are ever going to be able to achieve group and case discussions that are wholly electronic. You may well have to have local faculty, as in fact you saw with ATL else, elsewhere, um, and Zoom participation of international faculty. Practical skills are not possible. Now, we've just held our first post-COVID DSTC, and we fortunately had a big lecture room. We did not have any international, that happens across Asia. So we were able to distance very happily. The hands-on course was very simple. Actually, you're probably at your safest in the operating room because your PPE is outstanding. So all course participants get a PCR before attending the course. PPE is issued to all course participants. Um, the anesthesia risks are much less in animals than they are in humans because most animals do not carry uh, COVID. We limit the number of tables so that the spacing of the surgical tables is bigger. Now, one of the ways you can do this is doubling up. So we do it in, for example, Japan, where there are two tables that are used instead of the four, but 50% attend lectures while the others are doing the tables. And then they swap over so that the amount of live tissue time 
is unchanged, but we end up duplicating, you sometimes have to increase your faculty participation. And again, the local faculty in most of the countries is so good that we have no unhappiness at all about driving everything in the skill stations with local faculty and relying on the experience of international faculty as and when it's needed. So e-learning, all of the above. Can we get away with face-to-face -face lectures? We probably don't need as many. Group discussions, you probably need as many, but in different format. And practical skills, as yet, there is no substitution. We'll see where we go. Probably with simulation in the future, yes. I was privileged to visit Mark Boyer, who runs the simulation for the US military. And they have a simulated leg, which bleeds, pulsatile, and you can do fasciotomies and all of that on it. Each simulated leg can only be used once. And there is a cost of between one and 2000 US dollars just for the leg. And he took me into a warehouse where they're going to, they're going to count the used legs and how many were done incorrectly. And they had 12,000 legs there. That's $1.2 million on once only use fasciotomies. Sadly, I think DSTC is some distance from that. If you really want to contribute to world surgery, if you want to contribute to world trauma, join YATSI. It is the most global. We have members in 93 different countries. As I said, it's anywhere down to a quarter of the normal membership cost if you come from a lower middle income country and trainees and under 40 year olds, it's half that. Add your voice to Yatsik for global surgery. And Elmin Stein, who is the president of Yatsik, will be at this meeting next month and she is well worthwhile listening to. Thank you so much for the uh, support Thank you for so much for everyone involved in the Singapore Trauma Initiative. It's huge fun. Congratulations on what you're doing, and I wish you every success. Thank you.